I'll be talking today about some randomized clinical trials and how they're designed both for adjunctive therapy and to evaluate monotherapy. I'm going to talk about some limitations of those uh, trials in terms of safety and side effects and the use of historical controls. Uh, and then I'll wrap up by talking about what, uh, how we can use clinical trials to uh, give us safety information. So most people are familiar with the gold standard, which is the randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. Uh, and in this kind of study, one group of patients receives an intervention, and another group of patients receives no intervention. Uh, the issue is that with epilepsy, it's not really ethical to withhold treatment or to provide no treatment uh, to a group of patients. So most clinical trials have used an uh, adjunctive model where patients remain on their anti-epileptic drugs and then the study drug is added on or placebo is added on. The advantages of this kind of trial uh, are that they do give you information about efficacy in those uh, situations of the trial, and they provide some information on tolerability and ease of use. Um, but there are also some drawbacks, and uh, they're listed on this slide. But one of the biggest concerns is that the adjunctive trials don't really give you information about epilepsy monotherapy or using the drug alone. Uh, so side effects that are reported during the, during the adjunctive trials may reflect uh, a combination of factors relating to not just the study drug but the baseline drug as well. It turns out that there are regulatory restrictions that are different in Europe and the United States when looking at monotherapy. Uh, the um, European Medicines Agency does allow equivalence or non-inferiority uh, to show efficacy of a new drug but the United States FDA does not accept equivalence, and they reason that uh, the new drug and a standard drug might equally be effective, but on the flip side, they may also be equally ineffective. The problem lies in uh, that it's very difficult to prove that a new drug is superior to an existing drug when used at therapeutic doses. So monotherapy trials have been designed uh, in an attempt uh, to show that drugs, a new drug is effective by itself. Uh, and to use a placebo that is completely ineffective is not ethical. So what have been used are placebos that are lower dose than, uh, than usual. So a low dose comparator, it's also called an active placebo or a pseudo placebo. And there are two types of trials that have been done. The first is a conversion to monotherapy trial where patients uh, are on their antiepileptic drugs, the study drug is added, and then they're tapered off their previous drugs and remain on the monotherapy, either for a specified interval of time or until they need to exit because of uh, seizures or side effects. Uh, another type of trial is the uh, pre-surgical conversion to monotherapy. And this group of patients are patients that are going to be taken off their antiepileptic drugs anyway because they're going to come into the hospital for epilepsy monitoring. Uh, so once the seizures have been recorded as needed for the pre-surgical evaluation, they are then started on the study drug or the active control, and they're continued to be monitored generally for 8 to 14 days or until they need to exit. Exit criteria have been fairly consistent among the trials, and the exit criteria consist of a doubling of partial seizure frequency in any 28-day period compared to baseline, or a doubling of the highest consecutive two-day seizure frequency, uh, or a single convulsive seizure if none of them occurred during the baseline, or any kind of worsening of seizures as assessed by the investigator uh, requiring inter intervention. So monotherapy trials can be uh, useful, but there are defini definitely some limitations. And one of the biggest concerns is that it remains ethically questionable to subject the active placebo arm to a dose of drug that's really thought to be subtherapeutic. This puts those groups of patients uh, at risk for having seizures and seizure-related injuries and things like status epilepticus and even SUDEP. Uh, and it turns out that looking at the uh, active placebo arms of clinical trials that have been done, these patients have a higher rate of exiting than those who had, who had received the active drug. Um, and that led to the idea that instead of subjecting new groups of patients to, be, uh, to receive active placebo, that perhaps we could 
use the data that we have already gathered from clinical trials and use historical controls. And the FDA now accepts the concept of using historical, historical controls in conversion to monotherapy trials. And this was based on demonstrating that uh, the pool of patients who received uh, pseudo-placebo has a predictable uh, response to this kind of treatment. And uh, Jackie French published a trial that looked at uh, 10 studies that used conversion to monotherapy. And two of them were excluded because of differing uh, methods. And eight were included. And it turned out that in all of these trials, the control population received either pseudo placebo or low dose of the study drug or 15 milligrams per kilogram of valproate. The primary endpoint for all of these studies was a uh, percentage of patients who exited from the trial. And the exit rates range from 75% to 95%. Um, so the question arose when using historical controls is where do you set the bar? And it has been proposed that uh, for a single trial, the bar is set at the lower limit of the predicted interval of 95%, which is a 65% rate based on the historical controls. So a new drug would have to have an exit rate percentage of lower than 65% in a trial in order to be deemed effective. There are some pros and cons of historical controls, and there have already been studies done using these of newer uh, agents, some that are already available and some that are forthcoming. The pros are that uh, all of the patients receive an anti-epileptic drug at a dose that's anticipated to be therapeutic. But the concern is that there are some uh, potential biases in that the study is not blinded to the investigator or to the patient taking the drug. There are some other safety and tolerability controls. Uh, uh, concerns uh, that I've listed here on this slide. One is that um, just because we prove that a drug is better than placebo, it doesn't necessarily help us select the best or the safest drug among the choices that are available. There are also concerns that uh, there are strict inclusion and exclusion criteria so that the patients that we see in our clinics uh, may not uh, be the same as those patients that enter trials. Patients who are in trials tend to have medication-resistant epilepsy that's difficult to control. In addition, the young and the old are often excluded from trials. People who are pregnant or want to become pregnant are excluded. Uh, people with significant comorbidities are often excluded. Trials tend to be short on the order of weeks to months, and so therefore they don't uh, necessarily show us what kind of side effects or safety concerns might emerge over longer intervals of time. And I think a major point to be concerned about is that the number of patients involved in these pre-launch clinical trials is really too small to identify rare but potentially very serious side effects. So as a cautionary example, uh, we'll look at Felbamate, and it was one of the, it was the first of the new generation of anti-epileptic drugs, uh, and it was uh, approved in 1993. And prior to launch, about uh, 3,000 patients had received the drug, and it was widely marketed as a safe drug that didn't need a lot of monitoring, and there weren't really any safety concerns or red flags. Because it was the first of the new drugs, it was very widely prescribed, and in the first year, over 100,000 patients received it. And in that first year, there were uh, 31 reports of aplastic anemia and 18 reports of hepatic failure. Uh, now this raised a huge amount of concern. On close review, not every single one of those cases was directly attributable to felbamate, but a significant number were. And this led to warnings from the FDA and a required consent form, and felbamate went from being a very widely prescribed drug to a, a rarely prescribed drug. And a second uh, example is that of vigabatrin. Uh, when vigabatrin was developed, there were just rare and sporadic uh, cases about uh, visual field defects. It didn't really raise any concerns. Uh, and it was approved for use in other countries uh, in the late 80s and early 1990s. Um, then in 1997, there was a case report of three cases of people who had visual field defects. Um, one was tunnel vision, and some of the others reported things like bumping into things more frequently than they had before. And as more and more case reports came out about uh, visual concerns, uh, people started to, to perform visual field testing in patients who had received vigabatrin. And it became clear that 
concerningly, the, the deficits were very frequently asymptomatic until they were very severe. Uh, it was also clear that patients didn't always report symptoms that would directly make you think about a visual field uh, defect. So they would report things like somnolence or clumsiness rather than difficulty seeing. Uh, so these factors really uh, resulted in delayed recognition of visu visual field uh, deficits and underestimation of the risk in early studies. And we now know that there's a 30% risk of visual field defects in patients with vigabatrin. And the FDA has responded by requiring that patients in the United States have uh, baseline visual field testing and follow-up testing every 90 days while on vigabatrin. And this is required before they can actually receive the medication from a central pharmacy. So the lessons that we've learned are that the number of patients involved in invest investigational drug trials is really too small to identify all of these rare but uh, very concerning potential side effects. You need uh, anywhere from 30,000 to 100,000 uh, patients. And it's doubtful that really any pre-release trial uh, can adequately uh, identify all of these uh, potential concerns. We also need to remember that anti-epileptic drugs that have unique mechanisms of action also may have unique toxicities. As an example, the vigabatrin with visual field defects and the shortened QT interval with rufinamide. Uh, there are some phase four studies uh, that are done that have been very helpful. These are studies that are performed on drugs that are available on the market. And when they're well defined, when, when they're well designed, they can show us very useful information about how drugs are used in the real world type of situation. So many people are familiar with the VA cooperative trials. And these trials um, measured uh, retention, how long a patient stayed on a drug. And that was very helpful because it's a measure that combines some other parameters, uh, efficacy, tolerability, and safety into one uh, real-world measure. Uh, there's also the SANAD trial, which was a UK trial that compared carbamazepine with four newer anti-epileptic drugs. And this was a, a well-done trial that allowed the physician um, some flexibility in the titration and dosing and even discontinuation of the drug if necessary. So it reflected real-world practice. Uh, these kinds of studies are very helpful in helping us uh, choose among agents, but even they are not uh, designed to show us what kind of long-term uh, side effect and safety concerns there might be. Uh, the FDA does post-marketing surveillance, and one of their uh, largest reaching uh, alerts was in 2008, uh, when after a large uh, meta-analysis of various studies, uh, they reported that there was a higher risk of suicidality in patients who received anti-epileptic drugs. Patients received these drugs not only for epilepsy, but sometimes for psychological diagnoses or for pain. Um, the study that the, a the FDA did w did receive some criticism. There was concern that studies that did not sh uh, have any suicidality were excluded from the analysis. A and also that the 11 anti-epileptic drugs that were studied were uh, studied as a group, and so they weren't really subdivided uh, according to mechanism of action. And then people made the very valid point that one needs to weigh the risk of suicidality with the risk of uncontrolled seizures. And further studies uh, characterized this risk, and a large study of over 44,000 patients uh, found that um, the risk of suicidality varied according to which uh, drug a person was taking. So phenobarbital and the older anti-epileptic drugs had a low risk, and a subset of newer anti-epileptic drugs that are known to be associated with depression did have a significant risk. Another large study looked at a, a population of over 5 million people and found that when people were taking anti-epileptic drugs for epilepsy, they did not have an increased risk of suicidality. But when they were taking them for other problems, such as depression or, uh, or other issues, that there was a higher risk. Um, so we've seen that there have been some safety improvements in clinical trials. Um, definitely historical controls have helped us in terms of no longer needing to subject patients to subtherapeutic doses of medication. Uh, there have also been meta-analyses that allow us to con compare and contrast anti-epileptic drugs across clinical trials in addition to within clinical trials. Uh, phase four trials help us see how anti-epileptic drugs are used in the real world. 
uh, but n none of these really uh, identify all of the potential safety concerns. And for that, it's extremely important to have post-marketing uh, surveillance uh, programs and registries that allow physicians and patients uh, to report concerns. Uh, and in this day and age, there is really an emerging science of safety. So uh, at the molecular level, uh, biologists are trying to identify uh, genetic or biologic features of a person that might uh, tell us that that person it would do well on a drug or perhaps not do well on a drug. They're also looking at the actual molecular structure of drugs to see if there are any properties that uh, tend to be associated with uh, concerning side effects or adverse effects. Uh, we have expanded post-marketing uh, surveillance systems. Um, there's been integration of data from wider sources, including global sources. Uh, and there are ways of doing signal analysis on all of these uh, large masses of electronic data to identify red flags so that we have early knowledge of what to look for. So in summary, I've uh, tried to uh, show you that undertreatment of epilepsy in clinical trials does pre present a real risk to patients, um, that randomized clinical trials are very very uh, helpful in what they uh, tell us, but that their scope is somewhat limited. So they have a high internal validity, but not necessarily a, um, a great application to how they're used in everyday practice. Um, we're making progress in designing trials uh, that have improved safety, uh, and historical controls have really helped us to do that. Um, early clinical trials may not really reveal long-term side effects, and that's become clear. Um, so we really need to synthesize data from a wide variety of sources. There's no one study that's going to give us all the answers that we need. And thankfully, there are new technologies uh, available today and under development that will help us recognize these concerns early. Thank you.